in the Rostov region of Russia, 1995, a chilling pattern emerged as the bodies of women began to appear across the area, seemingly having suffered a truly horrific demise. Witnesses reported sightings of a man fleeing from the crime scenes. This elusive figure always remained a step ahead, taunting law enforcement with cryptic notes left at the crime scenes, hinting at his thoughts and potential next moves. This string of brutal acts unfolded in the same vicinity where the notorious Andre Chikatilo conducted his reign of terror, claiming the lives of dozens of women in the 1980s. The similarities in the MO raised suspicions of a copycat at work. However, the new perpetrator took a perverse pride in the comparison, boasting to surpass even Chikatilo in depravity, claiming that his predecessor did nothing compared to the horrors he himself would unleash. I just want to say thank you to Aura for sponsoring this video. Have you ever Googled yourself to see how much information is out there? I have, and it's pretty scary. I found some work history, old photos, and personal information that I just didn't expect to be on there. This is how you get spam callers and emails from scammers with dodgy links. And this all happens because people called data brokers sell your information to spammers, call callers, and basically anyone who wants to know more about you can do for a small fee. But not for me, because I have this all-in-one tool called Aura, which identifies my information and does all the hard work for me and removes all my information from the data brokers. It's also more than this. It's an antivirus, a VPN, a password protector, and it can even monitor online chat. It's really easy to sign up, so keep you and your family safe with Aura. And while I'm here, don't forget to drop the video a like, because it really helps me out. Thank you. On a bleak winter's day, the 21st of February, 1995, a macabre discovery was made on the outskirts of Shakti, a city in Russia's Rostov region. There, the lifeless body of Lydia Ivanushka, aged 50, was found. Her final moments spent working as the security guard of a construction site nearby where her remains were found. Her body bore the violent signs of a savage attack with roughly 20 stab wounds. The coroner's grim analysis revealed that most of the wounds began in the lower abdomen and reached up through the body and piercing the heart. The detectives, shocked by the cold-blooded nature of the crime, believed the murder was from domestic violence, likely out of jealousy. This theory became the focal point of their investigation. In the 1990s, the Rostov region, and particularly the city of Shakti, was notorious for high crime and murder rates. The area was struggling with unemployment, criminal gangs, and lots of domestic violence. The area was deemed a black zone by authorities. But because of this high crime rate, finding a dead body was not so out of the norm and officers believed the assailant was someone that she knew. Anatoly Evseev, leading one of the investigative units, harbored a different perspective. He was convinced that they were dealing with a serial killer and an intimate predator whose violent spree was bound to continue. Despite skepticism from his fellow officers who viewed his fixation on serial killers as a near obsession and was too eager to name this perpetrator one, Anatoly was one of the lead investigators responsible for the capture of Andrei Chikatilo. 
and was seen as a legend in the field. He had painstakingly built a database of 30,000 violent inmate criminals and killers to identify patterns to apprehend future potential serial killers. His dedication also extended to writing a book on Russian serial killers. He argued that the nature of the crime went beyond a mere crime of passion. The choice of weapon and the post-mortem mutilation of the victim pointed to a darker narrative. Although there was no evidence of an intimate assault at the murder scene, the severity of the injuries the victim sustained said the crime was that of an intimate nature. The assailant reached into the victim's vagina and ripped out two meters of intestine, and he would go on to stab the victim's breasts, heart, and vagina. They were also left naked. It was this nakedness that led Anatoly to conclude that the crime was intimately motivated. He said that there was a new maniac, and it would only be a matter of time before they strike again. Obviously, times have changed, and today we know a lot more, but these crimes were so brutal and glaringly obvious that they were committed by a predator. It must have been so frustrating for Anatoly, who was clearly thinking ahead of his time. Despite ongoing skepticism from his team, a second gruesome murder lent weight to Anatoly's theories. A mere week later, a woman's body was discovered by a bus station naked and mutilated, mirroring the previous crime. The killer's method was unmistakable. He had again removed the victim's intestines through her vagina with sheer brutality and stab wounds to the lower abdomen again reaching the heart. Yet doubt still lingered among some of Anatoly's colleagues about the possibility of a single perpetrator. It wasn't until Anatoly teamed up with Amaran Yindiv, a fellow investigator and trusted friends from their days of hunting the notorious Andre Chikatilo together, that his theory gained traction. Yindiv, familiar with the grim patterns of such criminals, quickly agreed with Anatoly's view of this being a single perpetrator. They recognized that this was the start of a killing spree by a serial killer, one that had to be stopped before more lives were claimed. Yindiv agreed to help Anatoly as soon as possible, but in the meantime, he was working on his own case. Another predator that roamed free on those same streets, targeting solitary women in the Rostov region's isolated areas. The perpetrator was striking women down with a steel bar and robbing their belongings. This predator had recently attacked a female security guard at a secondary school, hitting her from behind with the steel pipe four times on the head before robbing everything he could. A few days later, he struck another lone woman who was walking home after work. He hit her eight times in the head and again robbed her. Yindiv immediately drew attention to the unmotivated cruelty of the attacker. He never limited himself to a single blow to stun the victim. Yindiv believed he had to act fast as the perpetrator clearly took pleasure from the attacks and they were growing more frequent and he knew it was only a matter of time before this predator turned to murder. One week on and we are back to find that the killer has struck yet again. The signature method of murder was unchanged. A brutal series of at least 20 stabbings to the lower abdomen leading up to the heart. The internal organs violently extracted through the vagina. The locations of the killings varied between three local areas, Shakti, Sesk, and Siran. Each crime scene chosen within close proximity, but far enough to confuse the pattern. This movement suggested a calculated effort to evade capture. Police response was swift, deploying canine units and setting up hidden stakeouts in hopes of apprehending the elusive killer. In a bold move, 
female detectives went undercover, risking themselves as potential bait in isolated areas, in the hopes of provoking an attack. Despite their courage, the killer remained at large. The investigation revealed the murder weapon to be a blade nearly 20 inches long, implying that the assailant might be transporting it by vehicle. This led to a series of checkpoints and searches of cars, yet this avenue also led to a dead end. Then, the pattern broke when another body was discovered at a local cemetery. Again, the crime scene had all the hallmarks of the previous murders, but this time, a clue was left behind. Investigators uncovered a plastic bottle containing a note. It was a poem that appeared to have been penned by the murderer offering a twisted glimpse into the mind behind the horrors. It read, My home is my cemetery. Dead people in coffins are my friends. My comrades are darkness. And none of us is enemy to you who is living. At the cemetery, the police found what they thought was the killer's hideout. It was made out of sticks and foliage. Inside, the killer would wait for his prey to walk past and as they did, he would jump out and ambush them. More investigations of the previous murders suggested the killer was quite short, leading them to nickname him the Dwarf. The officers, running out of options, questioned every known Satanist in the area. In one house, where a group lived, they discovered bloodstains on the walls. It initially seemed like a significant lead, but it was later found to be from a dog's sacrifice and not related to the case. They also interrogated cemetery staff, yet none of these efforts led to any breakthrough in the investigation. Meanwhile, Yindiv was on the trail of the robber, wielding a steel bar who had already assaulted and robbed 22 women by this point. All the victims had survived, but were left with serious head injuries and fractured skulls. The assailant was elusive, always striking from behind, and moved between towns to find new victims. Yindiv had a hunch that this criminal would soon escalate their violence, and unfortunately, he was right. The predator was ready to draw blood. A young female named Olya Vinogradova became his latest target. Suffering a severe knife wound, she was stabbed in the chest area severely, but remarkably, she escaped, providing the detectives with their first description of the attacker. A middle-aged bald man with notably long arms, he snatched Olya's bag and hat and was last seen heading back towards the city. Despite the immediate deployment of the authorities, the assailant vanished. Based on Olya's description, a sketch was created, but just a day later, he struck again, attacking 30-year-old Tatiana Sakharova. He pulled off her hat, stabbed her in the chest, and then disappeared into the woods. The search extended for hours through the forest and nearby areas, but once again, the perpetrator evaded capture, as if he had simply vanished into thin air. Anatoly's investigation took a grim turn as the dwarf continued his spree. The latest horror emerged from Smolensk, where, on the city's edge, they found the charred remains of a young female who vanished three days prior. Identification was possible only through the remnants of her burnt clothes. At the scene, detectives discovered another chilling note from the killer that read, I was killed long ago. There is no me alive. After this murder, Yindiv was promoted to the head task force dedicated to capturing the so-called dwarf serial killer. However, as the search intensified, the killer grew bolder. In the city of Shakti, a new atrocity unfolded. A female grocery store employee called Natalia Turina was mercilessly stabbed with the same large knife used in the previous attacks. The assault didn't stop, 
even after the victim's death, as the perpetrator just stabbed the woman over and over again. The murderer, left with petty cash and an assortment of 10 bottles of vodka and wine. Once again, the victim's body showed no signs of an intimate assault. The pursuit continued, with a canine unit tracking the scent to another local cemetery. There, officers found what appeared to be another hideout of the killer. Close by was blood-soaked clothing and a notebook filled with strange entries titled Childhood, School, Prison, Cops and Court. Under each header was a list of names, but the murderer himself was nowhere to be seen. Whilst this was going on, Yindiv was juggling the robber case. There had been a peculiar law. It had been over a month since the last known attack, an odd break in the pattern, considering the growing frequency of the crimes. Just as the case was on the verge of being set aside, Yindiv followed up with the latest victim, who had just been discharged from the hospital. Her testimony was startling. She described the assailant as a short, bald man, wielding an unusually large knife, akin to a bayonet. This revelation led Yindiv to think, could the robber and the dwarf be the same person? If his suspicion held true, then the robber hadn't vanished. Instead, he had evolved into a fully-fledged homicidal maniac. This complex case took a turn when the investigators, Anatoly and Yindiv, used their past experience in analyzing patterns to notice that weather changes, especially rain, seemed to correlate with the murders of the dwarf. Drawing from their time investigating Andre Chikatilo, who was also proved to have committed his crimes around the time of heavy rains. Recognizing this, the detectives started to monitor weather forecasts closely. With the prediction of rain and thunder on April 30th, they anticipated that another attack was imminent. However, the exact location remained unknown. On May 1st, amidst the May Day elections, police and military squads were deployed across parks, forests and deserted areas around Shakti and neighbouring towns. Female officers, dressed as civilians, were strategically placed as bait. The festivities of the holiday added a layer of complexity to the police work, with people out in droves celebrating in the streets. As predicted, the killer seized his opportunity to strike. At 10am that day, amidst the celebrations, an emergency call came from the city of Salsk. It was reported that a man of short stature attacked 20-year-old Elena Stefan near the railway station. A bystander saw the man dragging Elena towards the forest park. Later, at 1pm, the same man assaulted Valentina Falco and her daughter Galina as they were coming back from the cemetery. Valentina tragically lost her life trying to stop the attacker, giving her daughter Galina a chance to escape. Galina survived and alerted the authorities. The city's entire police force mobilized to find the assailant. Galina, who was injured and taken to the hospital, could not give a detailed description of the attacker. She only remembered that the man had a blue-coloured left hand. By 2am, police had arrested a bald short man near the forest. The man apprehended was Vladimir Muankin. He immediately confessed to the murder of Valentina Falco, as there were two eyewitnesses, including Valentina's daughter Galina, who saw him at the crime scene. Galina later recognized that the blue on the man's hand was actually a tattoo. Despite this, Muankin denied any involvement in the other murders or robberies that had been attributed to the dwarf. Yet he was quite willing to share details about his life, giving detectives much to ponder about his possible connection to the serial killings. Vladimir's troubled past began before he was even born, with his father abandoning the family, 
leaving them in severe poverty. Growing up, Vladimir faced bullying from other children, which led him to release his frustration through stabbing and dismembering animals, like cats or chickens. However, it was his mother who was the most abusive towards him, resorting to archaic and cruel punishment methods, like kneeling on salt or coal, causing excruciating pain as they pressed deeper into the skin. His fear of his mother drove him to run away and hide in forests or the local cemetery. His school life was no less turbulent, marked by violent altercations with his peers and even teachers. As Vladimir Mohankin recounted his life story, he portrayed himself as a constant victim to everyone. His behavior eventually led to his placement in a special school for troubled youths, a place from which a staggering 80% of the students would later find themselves behind bars. Upon reaching adulthood, Vladimir found himself accused of crimes against young people. Though he was ultimately cleared of any wrongdoing, he then entered into marriage, fathering a son, and for a short time, he had a normal life. But then Vladimir's path took a darker turn, when he committed robberies that involved stabbing women in their hips. His time in prison for these crimes was marked by mockery and intimate abuse from other inmates. Although he tried to act tough, he was fooling no one in there. It was this treatment that fueled his desire to command respect. Upon release, he briefly aspired to become a priest. He even took a preacher's course, but this ambition was cut short by another conviction for robbery. By the age of 34, Vladimir had already spent more than half his life in prison. Now, detectives faced the task of proving that he was not only responsible for the murder of Valentina Falco, which he admitted to, but that he was also the dwarf killer. Additionally, they sought to uncover the fate of Elena Stefan, last seen being dragged by Vladimir into the woods. During interrogations, Vladimir insisted that Valentina's death was accidental and a result of a momentary loss of control. Yindiv realized that he was a much more cunning and dodgy opponent than Chikatilo. He said, I get the impression he's much more literate, smarter, even though he has seven years of education. Naturally, he was well aware that he was facing the death penalty for one murdered woman, all the more for several. Then, Detective Yendiv wanted to dig deeper into Vladimir's past to understand the reason for his crimes and the fact that he never intimately assaulted his victims because what he did to them was obviously driven by intimacy. Yendiv visited the specialized school where Vladimir was sent when he was young and one of the teachers there secretly told him that Vladimir was intimately abused by two female students who were working as trainees there. They were bullying him, torturing him, and abusing him. This made him hate all women, and his mother he hated the most, and this is when he started adding names to his list found in the notebook. He wanted to kill everyone named on those lists. And while he was killing his victims, Vladimir was imagining that he was killing his mother for all that she did to him. Once inside the pre-trial detention center, Vladimir quickly requested to be placed in solitary confinement, expressing fear of potential harm from other inmates. In an unusual turn, he asked that the investigator, Anatoly, stay overnight with him in his cell. The investigators recognized the need to build a rapport to encourage Vladimir to divulge details of his crimes. They fulfilled his requests and treated him with respect, which led Vladimir to grow more comfortable around them. Seizing an opportunity to inflate his ego, Vladimir suggested to the detectives that Andre Chikatilo's infamy paled in comparison to his own acts implying that his crimes were far more heinous. 
He stated that Chikatilo appeared like a chicken when compared to him. Detectives Yindiv and Anatoly as a crucial moment to leverage Vladimir's inflated sense of self-worth and told him that they agreed. Flattered by this comparison to Chikatilo, Vladimir began to open up, riding the wave of his narcissistic pride. He admitted to the murder of Elena Stefan, who had vanished on May 1st in Sisk. Vladimir Mohankin led detectives, to, led detectives to the location of a body of someone that he had killed because they were near Andre Chikatilo's house. It was just laying there, in the open, dismembered, rotting. He then proceeded to confess to a series of murders and robberies, recounting his crimes one by one. Between these acts, Vladimir frequently drank alcohol, boasting about a peculiar concoction he had devised. Homemade wine boiled with tranquilizers, which he consumed with pride. This potent mixture often blurred his memories, and he would sometimes find himself waking up in cemeteries with little recollection of what had happened before. Faced with the prospect of severe punishment for his crimes, and possibly execution, Vladimir started to act as if he were insane during his confessions. Vladimir professed to visions of demonic entities, an argument he thought would shield him from the consequences of his actions. But detectives Anatoly and Yindiv were seasoned enough to see through this charade. They requested all his written poems, including those discovered at the crime scenes. Vladimir, pleased at the perceived appreciation of his work, handed them over, unaware that his writings would later cement his mental competence and suitability for standing trial. As the truth dawned on him, Vladimir tried to deny the authorship of the poems, but forensic handwriting analysis validated their origin. At this point, his denial was useless. The evidence against him was irrefutable. Charged with multiple accounts of murder and attempted murder, he was eventually given the death sentence. But this was changed to a life sentence when Russia ended capital punishment in 1997. What happened in the following years in prison for Vladimir are not well documented. In 2006, he claimed to be adapting well to incarceration, yet in a stark reversal in 2009, he voiced his hatred with the harshness of prison life and expressed a preference for the death penalty over the life sentence he was serving. Vladimir is still serving out his life sentence today. Thank you for watching. Until next time, stay sane.